there. I have got some things that I want to share with you. This is Pentecost Sunday. And um, once again, I just want to say how honored I am to be a part of this service. I want Ephesians chapter number four and and forgive me for, for not actually getting this to you. I should have did this so you can have it on the screens, but Ephesians chapter number, well, let's go to Ephesians one first. We're going to go to Ephesians one, and I'm going to give you a moment to find that in your Bibles, or if they can get that up on the screen. Ephesians chapter number one, I'm going to start with verse number 11, and I'm going to read down to verse number 14. Ephesians chapter number one, verses 11 through 14. Now, this is going to be, y'all got me stirred up, <laughs> but but I have to stay still because I can't leave the camera and I don't know how in the world this is going to work with the way I am stirred up with what has transpired in that room already. But I'm going to try to stay right here. But if I leave the screen, I'll come back because I might have to take off running around my office because this is what you all have already been doing. This is what the anointing has already been producing in that room. And I just want to put an amen to it. Ephesians chapter number one, um, verse number 11 says, in him, we have also obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. I want you to underline that phrase, that we who trusted in Christ, those of us that receive him should be to the praise of his glory. And the Bible says, in him, you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom you also, having believed, were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is, and I'm reading out the New King James, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. That phrase, the Holy Spirit, verse number 14, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, which means that word guarantee right there means a down payment that the Holy Spirit is the down payment for our inheritance until the purchase of the possession, which means until we leave planet Earth, the Holy Spirit has been given to us as a down payment of what we will receive in totality once we get to heaven. And so basically the Holy Spirit is a down payment of heaven. And he is given to us so that we can experience on this side before we even get to the other side, a dimension of heaven in our lives. And so he is simply put to be given to us so that we can experience heaven on earth. Woo! Come on, lift your hands and say, I'm about to experience heaven on earth. That's what has happened in that room. It is heaven invading the earth. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit has been given to us so that we can experience the best that we can get on this side until we are redeemed fully 
with the purchase of our bodies till we all in a glorified state, the Holy Spirit has been given for a down payment of the fullness of glory. Now we know when you tie in first John to that verse chapter number three, when it says now are we the sons of God? Right now, right now, it does not yet appear what we shall be. For when we see him, we shall see him as he is, and we shall be like him, which means there is a dimension of glory we will never get to until we get out of these bodies and the whole renewing of a new heaven and a new earth, and we all have glorified bodies and glorified spirits and glorified minds. Until we get to that dimension, John says, don't wait. There, there's something we got right now. And so there is a salvation that we experience now, and then there is a fullness of that which is to come. That's why when you understand this revelation, you won't mourn people that die like we mourn people. Because when we think of death, we think of somebody losing out or somebody, you know, some sadness, some grief. But Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. It ain't until you get out of this body that you really step into the fullness of the dimensions that you were really created and born to be because you are no longer tied to the earth, to the natural, to the physical, to the carnal. You no longer have to deal with feelings and pains and aches. You no longer have to deal with the curse that's in the earth. And so when people die, they don't lose anything. They gain everything. So Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Why? Because until you get out of the body, you can't get paid in full. <laughs> Which means death, death is when God writes the check on the fullness of everything that you were ever created to be. And you step into the full dimension of being just like God. Just like Jesus, no limitations, no barriers, no curses, nothing in the earth realm. But until then, until then, the Bible says he sent the Holy Spirit to be a down payment on that. And I don't know about you, but I want to experience the fullness of whatever I can receive right now. Now, I'm not waiting till I get there. I'm going to work this down payment. I'm going to work this earnest money of the spirit of God until I fulfill God's plan for you and I, which is to have heaven manifesting in us in the earth realm for the purposes of redemption. That's why your Bible just declared that we were not created to just give God glory with our praise and with our worship. We were actually created to be to the praise of his glory. Oh, did you hear what I said? That we were not just created to praise God and give God glory. We were actually created to be to the praise of his glory. Whew, which means what God really wants out of us, it's for us to manifest who he is so that when we are seen, we are representatives of his glory. And I'm telling you in that room, I'm telling you the Rosellas have created an atmosphere. By the way, Peter, you didn't tell me you could sing like that. I mean, I was sitting here mesmerized at the anointing that's on your life. But I'm telling you, we should be such people, such uh, manifestations and representations of what God looks like until when people see us, it causes them to magnify God 
Isn't that amazing that God's about to do something with you that's going to cause men to praise God? I was listening to the young man giving the testimony about his grandchild, and I'm telling you, God's going to finish that work. And when things like that happen, it makes people realize God is real. I'm telling you, God is about to do things in your life that is going to cause people to recognize that God is real. God is alive. And we should be demonstrating in our lives these things that cause people to have an awareness of the power and majesty of God. And so you are about to give God glory with your life. <laughs> You're not just going to do it with your songs, with your music, with your dance. Oh, we do all of that. Thank God. But no, your life is going to be a praise unto God. When, when you speak, when you manifest, when you see the demonstration of the things that the Spirit of God does through you, it is going to cause shockwaves to come to people and awakenings to people that there is indeed a resurrected Christ that is alive and well, and I can see it manifested in your life. That is the purpose of Pentecost. I'm sorry, I forgot to announce my title. That's my title. I started preaching before I announced my title. The purpose of Pentecost. Now, in order to unpack this fully, you can't talk Pentecost without talking resurrection. Because it is the resurrection that led into Pentecost. And so the consummation of salvation moves in dimensions, which means being born again is not the end of your salvation. It is the beginning of it. In other words, once you get born again, you just getting started. Woo! <laughs> you just getting started. That's why people that have just preached salvation, that is great. And I thank God. And it prepares people for heaven. But just preaching salvation doesn't prepare you for the earth. Because salvation is the beginning of it is the beginning now of an introduction into the God kind of life. And so salvation now opens up a realm, opens up a dimension to us that God has created and predestined us to walk in. And so once we get saved, there are now dimensions and transformations and revelations and spiritual manifestations that we are now, we are now ushered into and that the Holy Spirit has been sent to lead us into those manifestations and demonstrations. And so the resurrection, the Lord began to deal with me. It's been, I'm, I've been stuck on it since Resurrection Sunday because I preached this message when Paul said, oh, that I may know him. And I heard Peter talk about it just um, earlier when he talked about the resurrection and how they he had been ministering on that here recently. When, when, when Paul said, oh, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection. The power of his, there is something the resurrection did that released me into the ability of God, the very power of God. All that I may know, Paul says, I've been trying to unpack what happened to me with the resurrection from the dead. He says, I've been trying to, 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 to know. He begins to go down uh, talking about his pedigree and what he learned of the law. And he began to talk about all that he knows and he was a Pharisee, a Pharisee and all. But he says, all that stuff I learned, I, I just kind of dung. 
for the excellency of the knowledge of God. He says, I'm after something that happened in the resurrection that all that knowledge and human knowledge and human reasoning, he says, it can't even benefit me now. I'm after something in a dimension that everything I've learned, just forget about all of that. And, and that's the way some of us feel. There, there are people who have so much Bible information, information, they can quote it, they can teach it, they have all the information, information, information. But Paul said, information won't get me where I'm trying to go. He says, I need revelation. Oh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. In other words, he's saying everything I've learned, in the law, everything I've learned studying the Pentateuch, everything I've learned, everything that I've attributed to my natural reasoning and education. He says there's something that happened to me when I got born again that I need a revelation of. I need it to be unpacked because he knew something happened with the resurrection. And all oh, stick with me because I got to take you to an empty tomb before you really understand the upper room. And the Bible declares that Paul said, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. And it was the apostle Paul. Think about it. Who God gave revelation of what happened in the resurrection. That he didn't give it to Peter. He didn't give it to James. He didn't give it to John. He didn't give it to Matthew, Bartholomew. He didn't give it to those that walk with him. But Paul received a revelation that none of them had. And it is what happened with the resurrection. And when God revealed this revelation to Paul, he says in the book of Galatians that once God revealed this revelation to me, he says, I conferred not with flesh and blood. To think about it, he said, God gave me a revelation nobody else had ever heard before. And it was so deep when he gave it to me, he said, I couldn't talk to nobody about it. <laughs> I, couldn't, I, I, I couldn't even bring it up. I couldn't bring it up because God gave him by revelation an understanding of what happened in the resurrection that not even those that walk with him had. And Paul said, it took me three years after God revealed it to me before I went back to Jerusalem and told the disciples about it. And once he told them about it, he says, they also validated and testified that what I'm about to reveal to you is the truth. What is that revelation Paul is talking about? The thing that separated the resurrection of Jesus beyond every other resurrection that had ever transpired was the fact that this was a spiritual operation. Yeah, a spiritual operation. Spiritual, spiritual operation. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead wasn't about a man coming back to life again. Many people have been resurrected from the dead physically. But Jesus' resurrection was a spiritual operation. <laughs> now, for you to understand this, you got to go back and let me unpack. Let me unpack what happened in Genesis chapter number one when the Bible says, and God formed man from the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. But then the Lord speaks to Adam and says, you're in my image, you're after my likeness, you have my spirit, my DNA, you have my mind, you have my, my emotions, you have my authority, you have been given stewardship over the earth realm. And I give you one commandment, don't eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat of that tree, you shall surely die. 
You know the story. Adam eats of the fruit and he dies. But now he's not dead physically. He lives to be 930 years old. So what death is God talking about? Come on, you go to King of Kings. You, you know this. He's talking about spiritual death, which means if you eat of that tree, your spirit is going to die. And what God calls spiritual death is the absence of his nature, the absence of his image. It is the absence of of his peace, his joy, his mind. It is the absence of the godness that brought him alive. And when Adam ate of that fruit, his spirit, his spirit literally became estranged from God, separated, lost God's image, likeness, lost God's download, lost God's mind. He lost all of what I call the divine DNA that was put on the inside of his spirit. And from that moment forth, man became spiritually dead. And you can't even get out of the first family before Cain kills Abel. And then you can't even get to Noah before God repents that he even made men. Because now that men have dead spirits, they are producing nothing but dead works. They are sinning. They're doing everything under the sun. They're under the control of, of the enemy. Satan has become their master because Satan is the Lord over the spiritual dead. Did you hear what I said? He is the master over dead spirits. And he had basically became the ruler of humanity because of the spiritual condition to the point where David says we were all born in sin and shapen in iniquity. Sin is the nature that produces sinning. Sin was the nature that came on the inside of us after Adam died, spiritual death. And because our spirits were dead, we produced dead works. We produced dead behavior, dead actions. Now, remember when I say dead, I'm not talking about breathing. I'm not talking about inhaling and exhaling. I'm talking about absence of God's nature and life, absence of God's mind, absence of God's love, joy, peace, gentleness, faith, temperance, meekness, absence of God's authority and the ability to function like God. And the Bible declares that we were spiritually dead. Our spirits were dead and we were like that for 4,000 years until, uh oh, <laughs> until what God had foreordained from the world. Stick with me because this is about Pentecost, I'm telling you. So now the Bible declares Jesus comes on the scene and this man, this babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, this man that's about to walk among us is about to give us a revelation of something. He is about to show us what a man that is born of the spirit of God looks like in flesh. In other words, Every man we see from Adam is just a dead man walking. Even though they're breathing and talking, they do not house the capacity of God. They do not house the capacity of heaven. But when Jesus shows up on the scene, he is not born of a man. He is born of God. And the same spirit that breathed life into Adam is the one who quickened Mary's belly and born out of her was this spirit being from heaven wrapped in flesh. And when we look at him, we are looking at what a living spirit looks like in the earth realm. 
and Jesus, oh my God, let me calm down because I feel myself starting to get a little tipped over in the spirit. <laughs> the Bible declares Jesus walks among us and shows us what a live living spirit looks like in flesh. He shows us as the last Adam what it is like to see a man in the earth spiritually alive. And because he is a man in the earth, he has to be anointed. He has to be anointed. And so now Jesus goes into the Jordan River and he receives something that was different than any other man had ever received. Because God told John, the thing that will be the mark, the demarcation, the thing that will be the sign that you will know the Messiah from any other person will be this. Upon whom you see the Holy Spirit descend and remain, that is the one. In other words, the Holy Spirit had come up on a lot of men. It came up on Elijah and he outran Ahab, Ahab's chariots barefooted. It came up on Samson where he took a jawbone. It would come up on a lot of people, but it would lift off them because it was never God's will that the Holy Spirit come up on men. It was God's will that the Holy Spirit come within men. <laughs> and in the old covenant, he could only come up on them for service, for duty, but then he would have to lift off them because he could not reside in them. But God told John, when you see the Holy Spirit come on somebody and not lift off of them, that is the sign that that is the one, because that is the one that the Holy Spirit doesn't just come upon. He comes within because he has the ability to house the very spirit of God. And when Jesus came out of that Jordan River, the Bible says, like a dove, the spirit of the Lord descended upon him. And God spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved son. Oh, don't forget that. I'm going to say that again here in a minute. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And Jesus comes out of the Jordan River, goes into the wilderness to be tempted, comes out of the wilderness in the power of the spirit and shows us what a down payment looks like. <laughs> he, he came to show us what is possible to have somebody who is born of the spirit and filled with the spirit as a man walking around on earth. My God, and the Bible says, and we beheld the glory. All oh, Jesus comes into the earth realm walking around with the nature of God. But then he has the power of God through the Holy Spirit, and we see the marriage of the identity, authority, and ability of God all functioning in one man in the earth realm. Oh, I want to rewind the tape and say that again. When we're looking at Jesus, we're seeing the identity, the authority, and the ability of God functioning through a man in the earth realm. And the Bible says he walks around here demonstrating what it is like to see what a down payment looks like in the earth realm. And your Bible declares, but this was not his assignment. You say, now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, wait, Isaac Petrie, what do you mean? <laughs> Jesus Christ did not come to earth to merely show us who we were. He did not come to earth to merely show you who he was. 
The Bible declares that Jesus Christ wasn't even the full mystery that God wanted revealed in the earth. While men were looking at him and marveling at him, the Bible says the whole mystery that was hidden from the ages in Colossians chapter number one was not just God and the spirit of God walking around in Christ Jesus. The Bible says the mystery is actually going to be Christ in you. That is going to be the real mystery, not how God got himself in Jesus, but how is this Jesus going to get himself in you? That's what he came to do. He came to show you a foretaste and a glimpse of what you and I are about to be. And Jesus did not come. Uh, I'm sorry. Let me calm down. I, I, gotta, I can't calm down. It's Pentecost Sunday. Jesus came to show you the works that I'm doing. You are about to do. The mind that you see me functioning in, you are about to have it. The power that you see me mantled with, you are about to have it. Because he did not come to have it for himself. He came so he could get it for you and me. Oh, somebody lift your hands. I can't see you, but I believe you shouting right now. And if you ain't, you ought to be. <laughs> and so your Bible declares, whew, my God in heaven, I feel the anointing. Your Bible declares that when Jesus went to the cross. What are you doing, Jesus? Jesus is about to pay the price for spiritual debt. So now you got to understand this dimension of the resurrection to understand the dimension of this fulfilling of the down payment of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is coming to deal with with the condition of spiritual death. In other words, Jesus is coming to bring life back to dead spirits. And this is what Satan didn't know. Had the princes of this world known, they would not have crucified him. <laughs> Had they known that it was a spiritual operation, they would have never killed him. Because he has to come and pay the price for spiritual death that was released upon all men through Adam. One man caused our spirits to die and one man is about to bring them back to life. And when Jesus is on the cross and he says, Father, into thine hands I commend my spirit. And he gives up the ghost. The Bible says, he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God. What happened on the cross? He exchanged his nature for ours. On the cross, he became spiritually dead. He did it. Don't be, don't be sad about it because he did it so that he could die. <laughs> because if he hadn't have took on sin, there's no way he could have died. Because the wages of sin is death. And because he knew no sin, death couldn't touch him. Physical death couldn't touch him. That's why they tried to throw him off of a cliff and he passed through the midst of them. <laughs> that nothing could stop him. Nothing could touch him because he had no sin in him. But on the cross, he became sin, which means his spirit literally died. He took on the nature of all of the things that were lodged inside of us by spiritual death. And Jesus died on that cross as a sinner. He didn't commit sin. He took up on him sin. And when you die, from spiritual death, you are separated from God. And he did that so he could get to hell. 
<laughs> oh, he did. He did it. He did it. He did it so he could get into the underworld because it was there that God was about to reveal something that nobody had ever seen in the history of humanity. You are about to experience a dead spirit come back to life. See, this is what the resurrection of Jesus is about. It is, it is not that he came back to life physically. Many people had did that. You, you had the widow's um, son in the Bible. You, 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 you had the man that was thrown in the cave with Elisha's dead bones. Now, if I'm going to have a resurrection, if I'm going to have an exciting resurrection, I, I, that, that's an exciting resurrection to me, to have somebody thrown into a cave, hit a man's bones, and comes back to life. That's a resurrection. If we're talking physical resurrection, Jesus' resurrection was a little boring. Because, I mean, take Lazarus. Lazarus had Jesus beat by one day. The Bible says he was four days dead and stinking if we're talking about physical. And then God spoke, Lazarus, come forth. And after four days, he comes hopping out the grave. <laughs> that is a physical resurrection. But Jesus' resurrection was different because all of them died physically and they were raised again physically. But Jesus' death was a spiritual death and nobody had ever come back from spiritual death. That's why Satan thought he had a grip on humanity because as long as humanity's spirits were dead, Satan could dominate them. And death had reigned in every man nobody had ever seen spiritual death defeated once a man died spiritually we never came back to life again but Jesus on that cross takes on sin dies spiritually goes into hell now his body is still in Joseph's borrowed tomb but his spirit is in the underworld where he is separated from God because when you're spiritually dead you have no access to the presence of God. I'm talking about the resurrection, y'all. And right there after three days and three nights when the father declared that the price was paid, Somebody lift your hands and shout because it is there that, that we, we saw something happen, happen that had never happened. happened. Death was undefeated. But in that moment, Jesus, right in the middle of hell's kitchen, if you excuse me, was born again. And we saw the first resurrection from the dead, we saw a spiritual dead man come back to life again. And Satan says, what in the world just happened? I've seen men come back to life physically, but I've never seen a spirit regenerated. I've never seen somebody go from spiritual death to spiritual life. I've never seen somebody lose the DNA of God and get it back. And that's what separated Jesus' resurrection from every other resurrection. He brought my spirit back to life. Oh, somebody shout, he brought my spirit back to life. He brought my spirit back. He brought it back from spiritual death, which means when Jesus got born again. That's why the Bible calls him the firstborn from the dead. Now you know what we're talking about. He wasn't the firstborn physically from the dead. Many had been raised from the dead. He was the first person ever born again spiritually. And he came out and says, Satan, you messed up because you thought you were getting rid of me. And you thought I was the only one you had to deal with. But what you literally did was give me now the power to give life to everybody who wants it. I paid for what Adam did, and now I have the keys of death, hell, and the grave in my hand. And the whole underworld said, what in the world just happened Jesus defeated spiritual 
death. That's why I'm telling you right now, there is nothing anybody can do in which they can't be born again. I don't care how bad, how long they've been there. One encounter with Jesus, he can bring their dead spirits to life again. And Jesus came to earth, went to hell for this reason, so that you and I could receive our spiritual life back. Uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. That means when I got born again, I didn't just get fire insurance. <laughs> Come on. I got more than just a get out of hell free card. No, when I got born again, I got my nature back. I got his mind back. I got his, his DNA back in me. I got his spirit back in me and spiritual life. That's why he told Nicodemus. Uh, he told Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom. In other words, he says there's a dimension you can't get into until you get born again, which means we were born again so that we could get into a dimension with God again. And he says, that which is born of flesh is flesh. I ain't talking about flesh, Nicodemus. I'm not talking about you going again in your mother's womb. I'm talking about that which is born of spirit is spirit. And you and I, because of Christ, have now been born again. We are now the children of the most high God. That's what happened in the resurrection. Our dead spirits we're brought back to life again. Uh-oh, but we're not done. We're not done. He says, oh, but Terry, in Jerusalem, because I got something else for you. <laughs> I, I got something else that's going to complete this experience. Because the one thing I gave Adam was dominion, was authority, but I never gave him power because power belongs to me. But God says on top of my nature, on top of my identity, on top of my authority, I'm about to give you power. Somebody shout power, 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 power. I am about to give you power. I'm about to send my spirit because his assignment is to show you how to walk in this. His, his assignment is to show you you've been dead a long time. You've been a dead spirit a long time. But his assignment is he's going to show you how to walk this thing out in the earth. He's about to reveal to you what you got when you got born again. He's about to show you things to come. He's about to give you power to cast out devils and to lay hands on the sick. In other words, everything that spiritual death produced in you, the Holy Ghost is going to be given to you so that you can reverse the curse. Oh, somebody shout reverse the curse. Oh, the Holy Ghost is going to be given to you so that everything that death brought in, the Spirit of God is going to knock it right on back out because he has been given so that now that you are my child, now that you are spiritually alive, you are going to walk Walk in the earth realm like I did. Don't wait till you get to heaven. I'm sending heaven right on to you. And I want you to take the Holy Spirit because he's going to give you the power to walk out this new identity, to walk in this new authority, to give you revelation, to give you understanding of what you have received through my redemption. And your Bible declares that when Peter was with Jesus, your Bible declares that he was so afraid, so timid, so weak, that he cursed that he didn't even know him. But then Jesus goes to the grave, comes out the grave, shows up to Peter, breathes on them, and they are born again. And then he sends Peter and the crew to the upper room. And then the Spirit of God comes on Peter. And that same Peter that was cursing and afraid that he did not even know the Lord. He was afraid of the persecution, afraid of death, afraid of fear that he denied the Lord three times. But after the day of Pentecost and his spirit came back to life and then the Holy Spirit came upon him. That same scared Peter 
stood up in front of the multitudes and said, let me clear my throat. <laughs> Opened up his mouth and began to declare, this is that that was spoken. He ain't running now. He ain't running now. He, I said he ain't running now. Why? Because he got his nature back and now he's armed with the power of the spirit of the most high God. Oh, let me calm down. Y'all got me sweating in my office. <laughs> Your Bible declares that Peter came out of that upper room with 120 and the rest is history. And they begin to walk in what Paul calls the earnest money, the down payment of inheritance. Child of God, hear me. The Holy Spirit has been given to us as a down payment of our full inheritance. You won't get the fullness of it until we get out of here. But the Bible declares that the Holy Spirit has been given so that we can function in the down payment. Now you understand Romans 8. Because Romans 8 says that we are groaning within ourselves. We're groaning within ourselves. That the glory of this, the sufferings of this present world are not going to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. And then it says that the earth is groaning, waiting for the manifestations of the sons of God. Why? Because the earth was subject to futility, which means there's a groan in all of us. There's something in us, a freedom, a dimension that we know we're not supposed to be bound, that we're not supposed to be dealing with sickness and disease and poverty and, and fear and drama and stress and all of that. Our spirits know that we were created for so much more than all of this, and we can't wait to be delivered out of all of this. But until then, Look at somebody and say, until then, until then, until then, until then, your Bible declares that the church is supposed to be in the earth realm, manifesting things in this earth realm that demonstrate the glimpses of the fullness of our redemption. That's why you won't be totally healed until you're out of the body and the body is glorified. But let me tell you what the down payment is. The down payment is even though you have to deal with it on this side, when you get sick, you get healed. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's how the down payment works. The down payment works, which means whatever you got in fullness, you get in increments, <laughs> which, which, which means I can't promise you you won't ever get sick, but I can promise you with his stripes, you are healed. You don't hear what I'm saying. We're supposed to be walking in this earth realm, showing dominion over the earth, showing how to get victory over the earth. When everybody else is confused, we get revelation. We know things that cannot be taught. They're just caught. They're just caught by the spirit of God. We're supposed to be demonstrating so much of this resurrected new dimensional life given to us by the Holy Spirit until when the world looks at us, we should be to the praise of his glory. The purpose for Pentecost was to bring an element of, of power and demonstration to the church so that those of us that have been reborn are not those that just have the spirit come on us. We're the ones that have the spirit to live within us. And we walk around as these houses of Holy Spirit that he uses us and so let me close with this because there are three things. There are three things you have to get in you in order to see these dimensions manifested. You already know them, but I just want to tell you what you got to do. Number one, you got to hear what the spirit is saying. 
The Holy Spirit has been sent to you to show you things to come, to reveal to you things, to reveal the mind of God supernatural ability. That's why right there in Ephesians, if you drop down to verse number 19, Paul says, I'm praying that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you may know, I think that's verse number 18, that you may know, that you may know that you have a wisdom in you that the world does not have. You have the mind of God in you. And so you've got to hear You've got to hear. Number two, in order to walk in these dimensions, you've got to speak. You've got to speak. I heard the young man say as he was testifying that as he began to pray Psalms 91 over his granddaughter, he got bold in it. What was that? That's the spirit of God rising up and saying, say what I said. Oh, my God. Oh, say what I said. Say it. Open up your mouth. And understand that I've given you the power to bind and you the power to loose. You've got to believe that you speak on the behalf of your heavenly father. Why? Because you're in the family. That's my daddy. He ain't some God out there. No, that's my daddy. I'm his heir. And if my daddy got it, I can say it. If he told me to say it, I can speak it. And so you've got to hear from heaven. Then you've got to speak on the behalf of heaven. And then number three, you've got to act. You've got to do it. You've got to do it. Look at somebody and say, just do it. It might not make sense. It might not be logical. It might not be reasonable, but the Holy Spirit has been given to you to do supernatural things, not natural things. Don't get me wrong. You need good sense, but you only need sense for stuff that makes sense. But in God, very seldom ever makes sense sense. <laughs> so you've got to be able to move. Jesus says, I do what I see my father doing. John chapter number five, I do what I see him doing. Whatever he does, the son does likewise. You've got to move. When God tells you to pray for somebody, you got to stretch out your hand and you can be in Walmart. You could be, you could be in Target. You can be at the grocery store, at the gas station. And if you sense the unction of the spirit, you've got to do it. Whatever God tells you to do, you've got to do it. And if you will hear from heaven, speak and act, you will see the manifestations of the spirit of God begin to come into your life. So you know what this all boils down to? What I've just preached to you and I is nothing that is going to happen to us. I just preached to us everything that has already happened. So the bottom line to this is today, we've got to believe it. Oh my God, just lift your hands and say, Lord, I believe it. I've got to believe you want me to live in a down payment of heaven. I've got to believe you want me to live in authority above the earth. I won't, I gotta believe that you're greater than pandemics and, and cancers and diseases. I, I gotta believe that the angels of the Lord encamp round about me. I've got to believe that you've given me power, that you've given me power, that the Holy Spirit is here to empower me to do and to have everything that's in my inheritance right now, right now, right now in the earth realm. And I want you right now, um, Peter, you and Tricia, however you feel led, I want you to begin to just take this and close it out. That's the only disadvantage I don't have is I'm not there so I can move and flow like I want to. But I'm telling you, faith is coming alive in you on this Pentecost Sunday that I was born again to win. I was born again, Jesus made me a son again so that I can experience a lifestyle of heaven in this earth realm. 
And yes, yes, the curse is here. Yes, yes Satan is here. But the Bible says, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And this is the victory that, that overcomes, overcomes the world, the world even your faith. I decree the prayer today, along with everything else that has happened in this room, this revelation comes alive on the inside that you may know what happened in the power of his resurrection. What happened to me? What, what's in my spirit? How can I tap into it? How can I draw it out? How can I be transformed by the renewing of my mind so I can walk in these dimensions of heaven on earth? Church, I encourage you. Let's walk out this down payment. Let's be to the praise of his glory. Whatever you're dealing with, you've been armed with the mighty power of God to deal with it in Jesus' name. Woo, glory. Amen. Glory. So keep them off for a minute, okay? Glory. glory. Lord. So before we let you go, we just want to pray for you, okay? Because yes. you, you just gave a great deposit into our body here. And you're in transition. So we want to sow seed not just money, but prayer. We want to hold you up in prayer because God's got great things in store. Yes, I think the best is yet to become. <laughs> what you're yes, becoming sir. in the Lord is not fully seen yet, but this is a big step of faith that you took. So could you stretch your hand towards him, church? Lord, we thank you for Isaac and his amazing wife and just the anointing that you placed on him. We thank you for his humility. We thank you for the depth of the word of God and how he has preached from the river into our lives. And we sow seed into him right now of prayer, of support, of, of lifting him up, lifting his arms up in the spirit that he would maintain this energy that he carries and this insight that he carries. We say greater things yet, greater things yet to come, greater influence on the kingdom of darkness and you know as i said isaac we're in connection with you and we hold you up in our prayers and a part of you a part of your heart was left here today and we're not letting go of it so you come back again all right we I bless you brother we, brother we bless you <laughs>